side of the main sanctuary, the so-called Beatitude windows, because each window depicts a Beatitude. And today we look at the fourth one, the picture of which is printed on the cover of your bulletin for your reference. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Well, the artist's inspiration for this window is Psalm 42, particularly verses 1 and 2 that say, as a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O oh my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. And in that window, as you can see on the front of the cover, you see a, a deer standing in front of a, a waterfall. And you can kind of imagine that deer running through the forest and getting hotter and drier as it runs until it kind of comes crashing out of the tree line. And there it beholds this beautiful waterfall where it can finally drink. We, of course, take water for granted because all we have to do is turn on the faucet. And there's plentiful water to drink and to wash and to bathe and even to waste if we want to. But in Jesus' day, water was quite a bit more precious. First of all, it was just precious because of the kind of, of <coughs> environment they lived in. In a more desert environment, you know, water is more scarce than for those of us who live along the shores of Lake Michigan. But second, it was precious because there was no indoor plumbing. There were no faucets to turn on. You had to go to the well and haul all your water home in buckets, and you can imagine how much more careful you would be with water if you had to lug it bucket by bucket, you know, four or five blocks from the house every day. So when the people of the Bible heard that phrase, my soul thirsts for the living God, my guess is that they had a different understanding of thirst than we do. Now, likewise with hunger. We don't always resonate with that concept much either because we all have well-stocked freezers and restaurants on every corner of town. And although we often profess that we are starving, the truth is, is that we hardly ever get past mildly hungry. So hungering and thirsting for righteousness is a concept that is just not readily available for us. The artist of the window suggested in his writing about his window that this beatitude might be translated better for us like this. Blessed are those who having become righteous through the blood of Christ, now desire nothing more than to live in the fear of God and after the pattern of God. When Jesus came to earth as man, he experienced firsthand how torn we are between the things of God and the things of this world. I mean, God's children knew that they should love the things of God, but Satan is so, so good at distracting us. He took that one, one little thing in the whole Garden of Eden, that one little thing that God said, this you shall not eat. And he convinced Adam and Eve that it was indeed delicious and could not be passed up one minute more. He led Jesus into the wilderness when Jesus began his ministry. And Jesus confronted the exact same sin that Adam and Eve confronted. Satan drew on his humanity and tempted him with things that should have worked 
for a normal man. Physical hunger, weakening in his faith, and then, of course, earthly power and wealth and greed. But Jesus, unlike Adam and Eve, Jesus was able to conquer him because Jesus was no ordinary man. So now Christ fills us with the word of God and holy baptism and holy communion, thus creating in us a hunger and a thirst for righteousness that we would never have had on our own except for him. The desire, the, the desire for righteousness, it's in us somewhere because God created us holy and perfect and we have been corrupted by sin so that although that desire for righteousness is there we still tend to pursue worldly things at the expense of our faith and after we pursue those worldly things if we finally obtain them, we find out that they're just shifting sand. In the end, we find that all of our vain pursuits are completely worthless. Many of you know Neil, my older son. When Neil was young, he loved cookies and cakes and candy. And some of you might remember, if you remember when we first came here, little tubby Neil with his double chin and flabby gut. <laughs> Sorry, Neil. He's going to watch this on YouTube. So. <laughs> but it's true. Then in eighth grade, one of his teachers, Stacy Nealon, got him to go out for track. And that changed everything. It began a complete difference in Neil, transforming him from a flabby, candy-eating lump to the ripped, motivated sailor he is today. And one of the things that I noticed as that transformation happened is the more exercise that he got, the less he wanted junk food. And the more fruits and vegetables and whole grains that he ate, the more he wanted Exercise and good food created in him a hunger for exercise and good food. And Jesus works the same way. The more we hear his word and receive his sacrament, the hungrier and thirstier our faith becomes. That's because just like Neil's muscles grew and demanded fuel for that growth, our faith grows. And the bigger it grows, the more fuel it needs. We should crave the Word of God on our own, but we don't. So Christ creates in us that hunger and thirst for righteousness. So that like a, a running deer craves water, we crave word and sacrament. The more we receive, the more we want, and it never stops. Did you ever know a really old Christian that is content to just sit all day long and read the Bible and hum hymns? In my ministry, I've, I've known several of them. They don't care about world events. Their aches and pains of age are unimportant to them. They do not desire to play bingo or watch travel logs on TV. They just sit quietly and either read or listen to the Bible and softly sing hymns from memory. Their faith has become so massive that it requires constant feeding. That's our goal. Our goal is to come crashing out of the tree line of this life, panting from spiritual thirst and feeling weak from spiritual hunger as a deer pants for flowing water. And there we see our Lord Christ 
with his banquet of word and sacrament spread out before us, saying, Come, come to me, all of you who are tired and hungry and thirsty, and I will satisfy you. But the food and water he gives creates an even greater hunger and thirst. An insatiable desire until that glorious day when we are drawn up into heaven and see him face to face <laughs> and are finally, completely, and eternally satisfied. Until then, keep feeding on God's word. Keep feeding on his sacraments. Because that's all that will strengthen us for this journey until he draws us into the promised land. Please rise and confess the faith with me in the words of the Apostles' Creed. <clears throat> 